Jeez. <laughs> one job. <laughs> Who said that to you? You have one job. You have one job. Okay, don't uh, say. And they're outlined in colors here. The red is the, um, uh, the nasopharynx, the green is the oropharynx, and the yellow is the laryngopharynx. You'll see that the laryngopharynx is at the top of the larynx. It's proper. So. All right, uh, the nasal septum, it's uh, bony in parts and it's uh, cartilaginous in parts. The, the front uh, third or half is all cartilage and it's uh, highly vascularized. We'll talk about that later on. Uh, but, um, Okay. <laughs> yeah, my brain is over there. Yeah. Well, at least your teeth aren't over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you watch the video? Anybody watch the video? We will later. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. <laughs> Plate. You know what I'm telling you the other day when the partial, it, if it over, if it's over the hard palate, you lose taste. Well, I know that from personal, not only because I've seen it patients, because I personally experienced it 30 something years ago. So that's nothing I need taste. It's because of the hard palate. But I was sitting here talking, just minding my own business. All of a sudden, my teeth go flying out. <laughs> 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 I reach over there and get my teeth. It had carpet all over it. Okay. So I was telling the story upstairs that Jessica is going to dental hygiene school. I've worked with Jessica for 10 years. She said, I never knew you ever. So, anyway. Okay, so the nasal septum is uh, the bony part is back towards the back. Now, remember the ethmoid bones. Uh, it's outlined in red. Um, it has the cribriform plate going up, it has the perpendicular plate coming down. And it attaches or articulates with the vomer, which is a little triangular pointed bone that is at the, that runs from the hard palate up to meet the perpendicular plate, the vomer. It's a, singular, a single bone. And then you've got the palatine bones, it, you can see it in the in the section that we showed you the other day, I showed you, that's where you're going to find the greater lesser palatine foramen. And then, of course, the maxilla is up front. Okay? The coanae is the opening in the back. There's a sphenoid bone uh, right here, since we're talking the midline. And just while we uh, have this picture up, just so I don't forget to mention it later on, and I did mention it to a couple of folks yesterday, the roof of the sphenoid sinus forms the floor of the hypothesis of fossa. So the pituitary gland, the roof of the sphenoid sinus forms the floor of the hypothesis of fossa. So one way to reach the pituitary gland, if you're doing surgery, you need to remove it, is to go up through the nose and then just go up through here with your uh, drill and stuff and go through the sphenoid sinus and reach the um, pituitary gland from the bottom. And that's one way it can be done. Um, if you look at uh, this illustration here, this is the septum. And so this is the lateral wall here. What's present on the lateral wall are these cartilaginous structures called um, concha. Concha. There's a superior, middle, and inferior concha. And underneath the concha, is a, is a uh, depression. That's called the meatus. So you have a superior concha, superior meatus, middle concha, middle meatus, inferior concha, inferior meatus. So if you were to take your little <coughs> finger and you stick it in your nose right there, that's going in the inferior concha. I mean, excuse me, in the inferior meatus. <coughs> if you look at your neighbor here, if you just look at the neighbor here, no, I'm not going to. You just look up, you know. Don't 
So if you look at your neighbor, come on, well, turn, 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 turn your head this way. You don't really, let me see, come up your way. Yeah, okay, but turn your head. You can see on the lateral margin, that's the concha, that's the inferior concha right there. You see it right there? Yeah, that ridge. You see it? Can we look at it? You see that ridge? Real looking nose. No, on the on the lateral side right here. The ridge. That's the inferior concha. So when you're uh, So when you're putting a nasogastric tube down, when you're trying to put a tube into the stomach, you do it through the nose. And so you've got this little tube. I have some NG tubes over in the lab. You can practice putting down the cadavers if you want. Um, or each other. Actually, I have a picture of one of this. One of their classmates stood still while uh, the other classmate put the empty tube down her. But what you want to do is you want to, you want to point the MG tube towards the bit, towards the septum. Because you want to stay away from the concha that are lateral. And you want to just run it along the floor of the nasal cavity. So you're running it along here in the inferior meatus. That's how you get the if you try to put an NG tube in, in this direction, you're just going to be crunching concha. Yeah, that's going to be, you're not going to get very far before they knock your head off. So perpendicular to the face, maybe point a little bit towards the midline, put KY jelly on it to lube it up, and you just, you just push it in until it comes down. Have them open their mouth, and you can see it come down into, uh, through the, I mean, by the hard pat, a soft palate, right? You can see the tip of them. Then what you do is you give them a glass of water, you say, okay, now, when I, when I tell you to, take a big sip of water uh, and get ready. So you get ready. So you've got your hands on the tube. They take a big sip of water. When they swallow, that's when you jam the thing in. So when they swallow, you have the blood is closed, and you'll always hit the esophagus. If you try to do it without them swallowing, you're going to hit the trachea. You run the risk of hitting the trachea. So just have them swallow, and then slam in. <coughs> Real easy. Yes, they will gag, but you just keep going. <laughs> get it in. <laughs> Once you get it in, and it's there, they won't gag anymore. Um, one time I was getting a uh, strep culture river, and the PA that I was working with said his pant, and I said, you turn on the pant. Yeah. And they said that with those two, uh, what? No, I don't pant when they, they, they just get your mind off of what they're doing. Um, it's kind of like turning your head and cough when you're doing a... The only reason you turn your head is so you don't cough on you. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason. So, uh, but with an NG tube, you take a, there's an anatomical reason you swallow, that's to close the epiglottis. Okay, so uh, here we have the concha. You see the concha, uh, and you'll see those uh, today again. They're very thin. They're very thin. They're. Um, if you were to get a grass, an aggressive nose picker and it went laterally, you could break a concha pretty easily. And you could break a concha with an NG tube if you're, not, if you're just careless. So here's the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. There's the crystalline, there's the cribriform plate. Contained within the ethmoid, there are three sinuses. An anterior, middle, and posterior sinus. These sinuses I mentioned when we did uh, the orbit, or, or actually cranial nerve, V1, because I described the nerve, a branch of V1 called the nasociliary. The nasociliary nerve, it enters the orbit along with the lacrimal and the frontal. Right, you know those, the frontal break, break branches into the superorbital, supracochlear. The nasociliary carries sensory fibers, somatic sensory fibers, to those ethmoid sinuses. So when you get the sinusitis, and I think I even did this in class, that you know you have that pain right here, deep in there. That's the ethmoid sinusitis. And when you're doing a physical exam on somebody, <coughs> let me get nostril here. 
Uh, <laughs> when you're uh, doing, uh, you're checking the sinuses on somebody, you want to palpate the sinuses. Palpate means to touch. So, I'm, you have uh, makeup on I me, mean, I'm not going to mess up anything. <coughs> so, you want to press on the maxillary sinuses. Does that hurt right there? When you have maxillary sinusitis, that hurts when you, when you press on them. And then you want to come up here and tap right here. Does that hurt? So what I'm doing is I'm tapping on the, I'm jiggling, I'm jostling, whatever you want to call it, the <laughs> ethmoid bone. I'm not really moving the ethmoid bone, but that hurts if you have ethmoid sinusitis or frontal sinusitis. You hear about the frontal, okay? So that's one way to look at the sinuses uh, in clinic. Nasociliary nerve, somatic sensory. Here's a, an illustration of the ethmoid sinuses here. They're up here at the top of the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity has the epithelium at the top of the nose. That's where you have the olfactory mucosa. So the olfactory nerves are at the top of the nasal cavity. The reason dogs have such a greater sense of smell than you do is because they're the amount of their nasal cavity that's where you find olfactory nerves is like a hundred times bigger than yours. So that is one reason why they can smell so much better. They have so much more olfactory mucosa. Right behind the ethmoid sinuses, here's our sphenoid sinus, and there's the, floor, uh, the roof of that forming the floor of that. Okay, now, um, on occasion, you know, we talked about the uh, pituitary gland. If there's a tumor arising, it's going to go up because it's sitting in this bony floor. And if it goes up, it can compress the optic chiasm, and that's where you get the bitemporal hemianopsia. If you don't take care of it, though, it will invade downward into the sinus. The sinus, the sphenoid sinus, as we'll show in just a second, has an opening into the nasal cavity. If that occurs, you can wind up with CSF leakage out the nose from this bony erosion. You understand now how that can happen, right? Here's the descending palatine nerve that I talked about yesterday, and that would be give rise to greater and lesser palatine nerves supplying the hard and soft palate. <coughs> if you follow that back up, that hole right there is the sphenopalatine foramen. If you follow this back up, I do want to say, if you follow this back up, that hole right there is the sphenopalatine foramen. On the other side of that hole, remember that fissure I was talking about yesterday? On the other side of that hole is, is the fissure. So the, the pterygomaxillary fissure opens up into the nasal cavity through that foramen. That foramen is called the sphenopalatine foramen. Because it's in the sphenoid bone. Right there, the sphenoid sinus. Makes sense. Right. Okay, we talked about this yesterday. If we look at the um, we look at the structures here. Here's our uh, opening of the uh, auditory, uh, the uh, eustachian tube, the torus tuberus, the salpingo-pharyngeal fold. There's our superior, middle, and inferior concha. And the meati are below it. There's the sphenoid sinus right there. These are frontal sinuses. The ethmoid sinuses would be in the, in the, picture, in the plane of the board. They're all covered by uh, mucosa. If we remove the inferior concha and the middle concha and the superior concha, this will tell you where the different sinuses drain. And don't write this down because it's on the next slide, okay? Bottom line, the sphenoid sinus drains into what's called the sphenoethmoid recess. 
sphenoethmoidal recess. It's on the next slide. We talked, I think, on the first day of class, or near the first day of class, that the lacrimal glands and the puncta here, the lacrimal apparatus here, drains into the inferior meatus. The ethmoid sinuses, the posterior one, drains up here in the superior meatus area. The anterior middle ones, and I don't really care that you know this, the anterior middle ones drain, in, uh, what, drain into this structure here, which is a big opening. There's an opening that's sort of semi-lunar shaped. That's called the semi-lunar hiatus. Hiatus is an opening. There's a, right below the middle meatus, you'll see this opening. That opening is the opening into the maxillary sinus. But also the ducts of the anterior and middle ethmoid sinuses drain into there, as does the frontal sinus. There's a uh, bulge by the hiatus semilunaris. That bulge right there is called the ethmoidal bulb. It's stupid that they should name a bump a specific thing, ethmoid bull. It's just stupid. <laughs> the hiatus semilunaris, though, is where your, is what I said, your maxillary sinus is drained. When you go have uh, surgery because of chronic sinusitis, and they go um, making your passageways bigger so that you, you can drain, where they do it is, understand this, the maxillary sinus is here. Don't you think it's rather odd that you have to fill your maxillary sinus all the way up to there before it starts draining out? So what they do is they'll go in here, if they don't mess with this, they'll come in down here and make a hole at the bottom of the maxillary sinus so it can drain. And because that high is semilunaris is sitting up here, that's why when, you're, when you've got a cold, you got a lot of mucus, when you lie in the bed on the side, you can feel it draining, right? And when you go back on the other side, you can feel the other side draining. Well, that's why, because it's halfway up. Okay? It's kind of weird. So does a neti pot go through these? A neti pot is a... Uh, is a funny named thing. It's basically, anybody, anybody not know what an antipod is? Some people don't know what it is. It's basically uh, a thing where you either, there's different types of antipods. You can either heat them up and get steam, or you can just take saline and blast it up your nose. All you're doing is you're keeping the area moist and trying to make this mucus moist so it will drain. That's basically what you don't want to do in sinusitis is take an antihistamine. Antihistamines dry these secretions out and they won't drain. So you can take a decongestant like Sudafed. You can take plenty of fluids. You want to stay hydrated. Get in the shower. You know, that's why it feels so good to get in the shower. Breathe that steam when you have congestion up here. It helps it. You're keeping it moist and helping it to drain. Okay? And that's why I said, you know, uh, when you have a nasal <coughs> issue from allergy or infection and you have swelling in the ear, it blocks this opening. And you wind up with a middle ear pressure and pain. And you can't pop, you feel like you want to, but you can't pop your ear. The problem is not your ear. The problem is the... the the nasal mucosa, and that's why you give them a nasal steroid to shrink the mucosa to open these sinus hiatus and the opening to your station tube. I just, you know, last year I got, you know, I got uh, upper respiratory something or another, and I was lying in bed. I was just lying in bed, and all of a sudden it opened up, and I just felt this rush of just hot mucus 
enter the back of my throat. Usually you never, you know, you're asleep when these things open up, you never know it. But it's like somebody just poured a, a cup of hot, thick mucus down the back of my throat. And, I, and it was like, ugh. <laughs> it was actually good because now my dang sinuses are open. Yes, ma'am. Are concha called turbinates sometimes? Turbinates, yeah. You can call them terminates. Terminates, yeah. What, uh, so, the decongestant, if you take a decongestant, does it just get stuff moving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all it is. Okay. Yeah. You, you just don't want to take anything to dry it out. Why? Because it won't flow. It doesn't, it, it dries out. It won't, you know, when you turn your head, it won't drain. You want to keep the mucus as, as watery as possible. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. And so uh, to, today in lab, don't, you don't need to uh, take off the inferior concha because there's nothing to see underneath there. Uh, take the middle concha off and you can see the hiatus semilunaris in the ethmoid book. This thing right here hung me up for a long time. What they've done is they passed a needle, a curved needle, in through the hiatus semilunaris and poked it through the inferior conscious, so uh, the meatus. There's no hole there. That, that's artificial. It took me for a long, a long time to figure out. I don't understand what's coming out of that hole there. There's no hole. They just drove, jammed it through the bone. I don't know why. Maybe to show you the, how deep the maxillary sinus goes. Now, what I also want you to do is once you see this, you know, everybody looks at it and goes, oh, yeah. Then take all of this off. Take all of that off, and now you're in the maxillary sinus. And you can look up at the top and see that nerve running in the roof of the maxillary sinus. What nerve is that? Maxillary. <laughs> it's V2. Okay, that's V2. Remember, there it dives into the bottom of the orbit right here. The bottom of the orbit is the roof of the maxillary sinus. So it's very easy to see. Actually, if you follow, if you see it there, you can take a, the forceps and pick it out of the bone because the bone is very thin, and follow it back that way, and you'll run right into the pterygomaxillary fissure and the pterygopalatine ganglion. It's, it's, they're all right there together. So there's the summary. On x-ray, uh, you can see all these things. On the plain film x-ray here, you can see the sphenoid sinus. This is the frontal sinus right here. It's not labeled, but there's the frontal sinus. Maxillary sinus would be right here. On this frontal view here, there's the maxillary. The ethmoid sinuses are in here at the top of the neck. You can see the cartilage of the meati. I mean the concha, not the meati, the concha right there. You can see the frontal sinuses up here. The frontal sinuses are very variable, and some people have robust frontal sinuses, some it's not so much. Uh, Ryan, that gargantu yeah. gargantuan skull of his, of their cadaver, is like four inches thick in the front, and I don't see any frontal sinuses. So, on CTs, a lot of times for people with chronic sinusitis, chronic facial pain, chronic headache, you get a CT, and you can see that um, the sinuses could be filled with mucus. They also, you can also see the lining is being thickened in chronic sinusitis. Uh, so it's very helpful on people who keep coming, who keep coming back every two months with another sinus infection. You can see the sphenoid sinus with the posterior, middle, and anterior ethmoids there. Uh, here is the here is the concha. There's the inferior concha, middle concha. You don't see the superior in this plane. Maxillary sinus, that right there is the optic nerve. Right there is the optic nerve. You can see the extraocular eye movement muscles around it. There's the uh, superior rectus. There's the levator palpebrae superioris. And it's just amazing if you stop and think about it for a minute. Okay. This would be the septum right here. What do you think that thing is right there? A booger. <laughs> <laughs> Boogers are radiolucent. <laughs> this has calcium in it. <laughs> huh? It's the inferior concha. It's a little piece of the inferior concha. Okay, you just 
getting the section right through there. So this is a coronal section, that's a transverse section. This is the uh, fissure that we described the other day, the pterygomaxillary fissure right there. There it would be the maxillary sinus. So you can just follow it right back and just peel, you know, peel the bone back a little bit, and now you're at the pterygopalatine ganglion. Very easy. Again, this is uh, superimposed. The maxillary sinus is here. There's V2 running in the roof of the maxillary sinus. There's the ganglion sits right below it. Now I got a, had a question earlier today. Somebody asked me how what's the relationship of the pterygopalatine ganglion? to um, taste going through there. There is no relationship, other than the fact that taste, it's a sensory, taste is sensation, right? So it's the picking up taste from the palate, it's going through there, but not synapsing. The only thing the pterygopalatine ganglion does is synapsing for the glands of the nasal cavity and the lacrimal gland I'll talk about in just a second. But the fibers are going to continue through V2. The pseudo unipolar cell body is going to be here in the trigeminal ganglion with this information going into the brainstem. And this is what it will look like today if you want to follow it through there. That's the opening into the maxillary sinus and the tegopalatine ganglion. Now, the lacrimal gland, we talked about the lacrimal gland is innervated by cranial nerve 7. The lacrimal nerve is a branch of V1. It doesn't innervate the gland. It innervates the skin overlying the lacrimal area. And I want you to take this, the, uh, the orbit, the upper, the upper eyelid today, and dissect through there and find that lacrimal gland. It's real easy to do. Okay? It's real easy to do. How you get parasympathetics from the pterygopalatine ganglion up to the lacrimal gland, because the pterygopalatine ganglion is seven. The two sympathetic Efferent, visceral efferent ganglia of seven are the submandibular ganglion and the pterygopalatine ganglion. So what does seven innervate? The sublingual, the submandibular, and the lacrimal glands and the nose. So we got to get somehow these sympathetic postganglionics from here up to there. And what you do, you see that little blue line right there? They come out of here, go up there, and hop on the lacrimal nerve to get to the get to the gland itself. That little connection right there takes them up to V1. Because the lacrimal gland is going to be ophthalmic, right? This area. <coughs> Sympathetics to the area, and this, this gives you both of them really. Sympathetics to the area, it's just like sympathetics everywhere else. <clears throat> Common, I mean, internal carotid, they hop off of there onto V2. They hop off of there onto V1 to make it up to the lacrimal gland. The sympathetics decrease tearing by decreasing the blood supply to the gland. So to get there, does it ride on a blood vessel or? No, it just rides on the blood vessel. If you look in the, so here is the ophthalmic artery. It should be the, that's the maxillary nerve. The ophthalmic artery enters the orbit, right? Right. It has several branches itself that correspond to the nerves. There's a lacrimal artery that goes to the lacrimal area. They're just going to ride with it to get to the gland. So the sympathetics always have to ride on an artery, artery. right? Okay, yep. just wanted to make sure. Yep, you got it.
The nerve that I want to show you here is the nasopalatine nerve. It comes through the uh, incisive foramen to supply the lingual surface of the incisors. So if I ask you what foramen connects the nasal cavity to the oral cavity, you really have one choice. It's the incisive canal. There are two other near choices. That would be the greater and lesser palatine foramen. But they open into the where the nerve is running. They don't actually open up into the nasal cavity. Everybody understand that? That sounds like a test question. You got a wink at us. What's that? Wink. That wasn't a wink. That was a. <laughs> that was a, It's going to be a damn test question. I saw this last night. Uh, if you don't want to know, if that thing right there opens between those two spaces, then, well, you got one wrong. <laughs> Can you see the incisive canal? Are there any questions about that? Yes, uh, somebody up here. Oh, I, I'd ask if you could see that incisive canal, because I don't remember being able to like really visualize it yesterday. Um, yeah, when you take a, to sort of take a dry skull, you can see it. But in your cadaver, I, I don't think anybody did this yesterday, but you need to peel the, the mucosa off the hard palate. That was part of the section to find those palatine nerves. If you pull the mucosa off right behind the central incisors, it's right there. You probably won't see the nasopalatine nerve because it's pretty small, but you can certainly see the incisive canal. Now, this is the blood supply, and I've kind of alluded to this before, but I wanted to make a special point about this today. Right here in the cartilaginous portion of the septum, it's highly vascularized because, you know, part of the function of the nasal cavity is to warm the air that you breathe. So put a bunch of blood vessels in there, and that transfers the heat. Well, this particular area is called Kesselbach's, tri uh, Kesselbach's area. Kesselbach's area. It's on the septum. It's on the septum. There are two types of nosebleeds. Nosebleed is called epistaxis. E P I S T A X I S. Epistaxis. There's an anterior bleed and a posterior bleed. The most common cause of anterior nosebleeds, and you see these in little kids all the time, is mechanical trauma from your index finger. Because you reach up there and you boogers and you, you uh, injure this highly vascularized Kesselbox area. And that's where you bleed from. To fix it, all you have to do is put pressure on it, hold your head back, maybe put a cold compress on it. This should stop bleeding within a few minutes. That's an anterior bleed. A posterior bleed occurs back here. We've got this uh, sphenopalatine mm. artery. It's the terminal branch of the maxillary. Right, the maxillary comes across here, dies through the fissure, and enters the nasal cavity. Now it's called sphenopalatine. It's a big artery. These things, if they bleed, they, you can die from um, it going down your trachea. You, you drown yourself, essentially. Posterior bleeds are medical emergencies. You always send them to the emergency room. You cannot stop it by pinching the nose. And they usually occur on people who are anticoagulated, like they're taking Coumadin or Plavix or something like that. And these things, you have to take them to the OR or the ENT people have to go up in there and cauterize this thing. You do not let these people go home. Yes, ma'am. Would there ever be a 
be a reason to cauterize anything that's causing like an anterior bleed? Anterior bleed, uh, most of the time just pressure will stop them. If it doesn't, you can use um, a thing called a silver nitrate stick. It's a, it's a cautery chemical. Just touch it like that. Um, you can use neosinephrine or aphrin because that constricts blood vessels. That's why you don't use that. Did I talk about that before? That's why you don't use it uh, for more than three days because it constricts the blood vessels. And if you do use aphrin or neosinephrine for more than three days, the part that becomes high, uh, ischemic is the cartilaginous portion of your nasal uh, septum. That's why you can put your finger out one side and out the other is because the cartilaginous portion is in the front. You follow me? Do most of your bleeds still require trauma? They just bleed more because they're anti It's usually not due to trauma. It's because you're anticoagulated. I guess I'm confused on how they start. Though. How so they what? I guess I don't know what that means. How do they start if they're... It's just like um, if, you're, if you're taking too much Coumadin. Yeah. I know they get caught. But and you're bleeding too much. A, a strong sneeze, or something like that, could rupture a vessel. And if it does, if it's posterior, they bleed like crazy. Okay. One of the things you can do to fix it acutely at home is to take a, if you have a, um, something like, a, like an NG tube, I'll just use that as an example. You pass it in until it, you see it in the back of the throat. You take your forceps and grab it, pull it out. So now you're like that, right through your nose. Tie a tampon to the <laughs> not the little dwarf uh, pads, but a ta an actual tampon out of the holder. <laughs> a string of the tampon to the NG tube or whatever tube you you have and pull it this way so that the tampon goes in and goes up to block the... So that's, you can do that in, in, until you get into the OR. That's the treatment in the, in the ER. It's quick to do that. Uh, so when you get a nosebleed, because the posterior ones can be so severe, is that why they tell you to lean forward? I've heard both. They tell you to back and set your head forward. So which one is correct? Well, um, the leaning forward is just has to do to keep the blood off your shirt, oh, okay. on the anterior. Um, if it's a posterior thing, the blood, and that's a, that is a good point, though. The posterior bleeds will, I mean, anterior bleeds will come out your nose. Posterior bleeds go down your throat. They're swallowing blood. And leaning forward is not going to help that. Can you still, can, it, can an anterior bleed still go down the throat? It can if it's big, but usually yeah. not. Usually just holding your head like that, it'll, it'll drip. Um, you know, just really, just if you're not taking aspirin or you're not anticoagulated, just pinching your nose 99% of the time will help. We used to pack the anterior bleeds. Somebody would come in with an anterior bleed. You'd take this gel-soaked gauze and these things called bayonet forceps. They're about this long. They, they look like a bayonet. So what you do is you take this gauze. It's only about you know, a couple of millimeters wide. You take it, grab it by the end of the forceps. <coughs> so I've got, the, I've got the gauze pinched right here. So I put it in the floor of the nasal cavity. And I pull the forceps out, pinch the gauze again, and layer it on top of that, and layer it on top of that. So what you're doing is you're building layers of this gauze, and you're putting pressure on the anterior nasal pack, uh, anterior nasal area to stop the bleeding. And you leave it in for 24, 48 hours, and it has the gauze coming out the nose. So to remove it, you just pull the pull the gauze out. But we don't do that anymore because that pressure puts pressure on the the septum, and you can wind up having high, uh, an ischemic septum. So nobody packs noses anymore with anterior bleeds. You just use neosinephrine or aphrin and pressure. There was a question somebody over here. So if you're anticoagulated and you have a frontal bleed or anterior an anterior bleed, bleed, would you just use aphrin and it works fine? Yeah, usually. Okay. If you have to pack them, that's fine. If you can 
once you've cleaned it out, you can usually see the little area that's bleeding, and you can take that silver nitrate stick and just touch it to the mucosa, and it, it's a, it's a uh, chemical cauterizer. It burns the mucosa, and it will stop it from bleeding. Okay. But usually just aphrin or neosinephrin and a little pressure will do the trick. Uh, here's the incisive canal, uh, right, uh, right there. Here are the palatine bones, the two palatine bones, right there. The vomer is right there. These are the maxillary bones here, and the greater or lesser palatine foramen are right there. There are a couple of anomalies uh, that you'll see if you look in people's mouths. You'll see them for uh, every now and again. This thing right here is called a torus tuberus. This is where the, as the uh, maxillary bones were, grow towards each other, and by the way, embryologically the bones grow towards each other to the midline. They don't start in the midline and grow out. They grow towards the midline. If you're going to have a, a cleft palate, it always occurs here. One side fails to grow. So it would always be in the middle, or, or just off-center. Torus tuberus is just where it overgrows, and there's a, there's a bony ridge. If you touch it, it's just bone. And people, you know, they don't even know they have it. It's just an incidental finding. This uh, condition here, these palatine folds, um, another incidental finding. Um, I bet if you look in everybody's mouth in here, one or two of you, have that torus tuberous, and one or two of you have the transverse folds. It's just a normal variant. So. Is this Cle those pieces of the I'm sorry? Is this those pieces of the thing? Yeah, it's, it's yeah, probably 95% <laughs> of people, it's smooth. Oh, mine's not definitely. What do you got going on up there? I think I, mine's not smooth. It's like those bumpy. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Oh, she's got the transfer. She's got the transfer. I think I have those. I thought that everyone had those. I got that Wait, do you hear it? Yeah. I never realized that was like an old lab. It's really bad. Develop. That's why you have these two ridges right here. Huh. So when they fail to fuse, 
then you have an opening right there, loaded off to the midline. And that can extend into the palate as a cleft lip and or cleft palate. So when a baby's born, that's what you always do. In the delivery room, it's one of the, when you're doing, you count 10 fingers, 10 toes, one of the things that you do is you stick your finger in their mouth and make sure they don't have a cleft palate. Okay, like how do you fix it? Yeah. I have a friend whose baby just, he just yeah. had this fixed. Well, you don't fix it immediately. Um, you let them grow a little bit, and then you can go in and surgically, surgically repair it. The problem with cleft lip and cleft palate is for the baby to be able to suckle appropriately, mm -hmm. either uh, breast or bottle. They don't, they just, they don't feed if it's, if it's complete. Uh, again, we talked about the um, glands that are present on the on the hard palate. Uh, you can see those, and then the origin of the nerves uh, in the back nerve and artery has a greater or lesser palatine uh, nerve and vessel. That's all we got today. <laughs> all right, so. Um, so let me give you a, a little bit of a quick advice and then we'll head on over there. Um, when, you're study, when you're looking at this anatomy stuff, and I told you on day one, you can't do this by yourself. You need to be having somebody to bounce things off of. Do you know it as deeply as the person you're, you're with? Uh, if you don't, then you need to focus more. One thing you need to keep in mind is that the lab practicals have the same value as the written. The lab practicals, those are free points. All you got to do is be able to identify reasonable structures. I mean, I didn't tag a lot of bizarre stuff. Um, everything I tag, we've dissected. Spending the time in the lab with a partner, if I, you know, each of you with a pair of forceps. Pick up something. What is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? If I tell, if I keep telling you, y'all need to look at the greater or lesser palatine. You bet your butt. You're probably going to see one of them. Um, so there you go. Yes, ma'am. The nerve you had tagged down here that was big that said be specific. What, what it was, was like, no, it was the brachial 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 Oh, it was the upper trunk of the brachial process. Oh. You could put superior trunk or upper trunk. If you put brachial, you got half credit for it. Uh, if, and um, there was the supraclavicular nerves. Mm -hmm. so they were really pretty. Superclavicular. That's not actually what I was going for when I started dissecting that body. But I said, oh, wow, look at that. Uh, there was an answer to the calendar. How do you use the red that you had it? You said what? Nerve that goes through here. Be specific. What were you looking for? I was looking for the S2 dorsal primary ramus. It was in the second for ramus. I think there was there was a lot of half credit for Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the only thing on this test, uh, as I understand it from Dr. Britton, is anatomy plus the pathophys from this morning. And I I think I give there was another pathophys lecture, I don't know when that one is, but it's not before Monday. So you figure you know, eight or so questions per lecture. We've got one, so the anatomy lectures are yesterday afternoon, today, two tomorrow, one on Friday. So that's roughly 50 questions, plus about eight or ten uh, pathophys questions. That's all. That's it on this test. <laughs> So today's so since today's lecture was so short, will it still will it only be like four questions, or will it be more since we don't have as much material? Is remember Dr. Burton saying like every hour you can expect about four questions? Yeah. Um, okay. You know, since the nasal cavity and the oral cavity yesterday and today is kind of mixed, uh, I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of. Well, there's no, certainly no more than 16 places. Okay.
for their own community. Now, starting tomorrow, we do the upper extremity. And I can tell you that there's a, there, there, you have a lot of muscles and nerves in the upper extremity. But if you, I'm going to try to organize them into groups. Uh, you remember the other day when I drew the brachial plexus on the board, it took me 20 seconds. You'll be able to do that tomorrow. So, I've got little tricks. Um, but getting a partner or two partners in reviewing this really helps. I thought it Ha <laughs> 